really wanted to make a video about Brownian motion, this jiggling motion you can see under a microscope, because Brownian motion does something incredible. It creates a bridge between two worlds, the atomic world and the macro scale world. And in that in-between world, none other than Albert Einstein was able to do something amazing. In this video, I'm going to show you a few different ways you can see Brownian motion. I'm going to explain Brownian motion with this model that I made. And finally, I'm going to show how Einstein was able to work out how much atoms weigh by observing and measuring Brownian motion. So the first thing I did was buy this smoke cell kit. You find a way to blow smoke into this little chamber. It's got this clever light and lens set up to illuminate the smoke, just like dust in a sunbeam. The whole assembly fits under a microscope. And look, I've got this adapter on mine that I can mount my camera to. This particular method looks great to the human eye, but for a camera, there's just not much light. So like I've turned the ISO right up here and you can see there's a decent amount of grain in the footage, but there you have it. That's Brownian motion. You see that jiggle of the smoke particles. Robert Brown wasn't the first person to notice the jiggle, but he was the first person to bring it to wide attention, hence the name. Anyway, I wanted to see if I could capture it more clearly. And there are different ways besides this little smoke cell. Another option is particles suspended in a liquid. That reminded me of a video I made about why white things are white. In it, I showed the ouzo effect. One clear liquid poured into another turns cloudy. It's cloudy because the liquid is now scattering light and it's scattering light because it is full of tiny suspended particles. The oils in the ouzo form an emulsion with the water. So maybe I could see those tiny ouzo balls under the microscope and watch them jiggle. In the end, they were just too small for me to be able to see, even with a microscope, but it's okay, because I noticed something similar with a different liquid, this dry skin treatment called hydromel. It also turns cloudy when you add it to water. And to me, that's a much clearer effect than what you get from the smoke cell, perhaps because the particles don't keep coming in and out of the focal plane. But in any case, it's good to confirm that Brownian motion happens in gases and in liquids. Another option is plain old milk. Milk is an emulsion too, actually. It contains fat globules. They're about one or two microns, but also casein micelles, and they're quite a bit smaller under a micron. So we should potentially be able to see two different levels of Brownian motion. And actually it does seem that way. The bigger particles seem to jiggle less than the smaller particles. Interestingly, when Doc Brown first observed this in 1827, he wanted to eliminate the possibility that what he was seeing was biological in nature. I mean, it's not an unreasonable possibility. Like, look at these daphnia under a microscope. The movement isn't that different. And he was viewing the jiggles of pollen particles after all. So perhaps they were moving because they were alive. Actually, pollen is typically too big to have a visible Brownian jiggle, but Brown saw the pollen particles eject even smaller particles out of themselves, and he saw a jiggle in those. But just to be sure he wasn't looking at motile little critters, he picked up a quartz crystal. Quartz very occasionally has water and air trapped inside it. That's called anhydro quartz, and typically that water will have been trapped in there for thousands of years. So if there ever was anything alive in there, it was certainly dead by now. That's sounded like a really cool idea, so I picked up my own bit of N-hydro quartz. That curved edge you can see in there is a boundary between water and air inside the crystal. Unfortunately, I just couldn't get focused that deep inside the crystal, so this is a complete fail. We'll take Brown's word for it on that one. Back then, people didn't know about atoms, but now we know that these tiny jiggling particles are surrounded by loads of atoms zooming around. And as they zoom around, and they smack into the particles. We typically don't notice the effect of these individual collisions in our everyday life. That's because there are just so many of them. Like there are just as many collisions of air molecules happening on the left side of this rubber ball as there are happening on the right side of this rubber ball. So the rubber ball goes nowhere. But on a much smaller scale, because these collisions are random, you will occasionally have more and stronger collisions on one side than the other. And so the particle gets knocked about in a visible way. By the way, it's still an insane number of collisions. Like a single molecule of water collides with other water molecules 10 to the 14 times per second. You might be thinking with that many collisions, surely it would average out to zero net visible effect on something the size of a micron. 
The reason it doesn't is because of the insane speeds of water molecules. At room temperature, the speed of a water molecule smacking into one of these particles could be anywhere between zero meters per second and several hundred meters per second. With that much variation, it's no surprise that you'll occasionally get a decent imbalance from one side to the other of one of those particles. What you're seeing here is a small model of that process. I have a dish full of tiny ball bearings that I'm jiggling to simulate the motion of, for example, water molecules. And this plastic bead is like a particle suspended in that liquid. And you can see how the individual collisions with the ball bearings cause the plastic particle to move around. But because the motion of the plastic beads is averaged over lots of little collisions, the motion of the bead is a lot less dramatic than the individual motions of the ball bearings, just like with real Brownian motion. It's also helpful to see an animation of that See how individual collisions from smaller molecules cause the larger particle to jiggle around. If you couldn't see the smaller molecules, that larger particle would seem to have a life of its own. And you can see that as the particle gets larger, the effect is reduced. And in the opposite direction, if the particle gets smaller, the effect is increased. So what was the genius thing that Einstein did with Brownian motion? Well, in 1905, the idea that matter was made of atoms was starting to gain traction, but still, there were a lot of respected scientists that didn't believe in atoms and molecules. Einstein did. And when he was thinking about Brownian motion, he made a brilliant assumption about the way atoms and molecules move. He said, let's assume that molecules that you can't see and particles that you can see under a microscope, they move according to the same principles and rules. It's just that they differ in size. That means that Einstein was able to take equations from the physics of fluids and apply them to this thing that we can see. He combined those equations into an expression for something called the diffusion coefficient, which is like a measure of how fast does something diffuse through a fluid. The great thing about this equation is a lot of these terms are things we can measure. You've got things like viscosity of the liquid, something you can measure. You've got the radius of the suspended particles, again, something you can measure. The only things you can't measure are the diffusion coefficient and Avogadro's number. That means if we can measure either one of those, we can calculate the other. In other words, if we can measure the diffusion coefficient, we can calculate Avogadro's number. And Avogadro's number would be an amazing thing to know. Avogadro's number tells us, for example, exactly how many atoms of hydrogen there are in one gram of hydrogen. And if you divide one gram by that number, you then know the exact mass of hydrogen. How cool is that? So if we want Avogadro's number, we need the diffusion coefficient. So how are we going to get that? Well, here's the genius part. Einstein realized that we can calculate the diffusion coefficient of these tiny particles by observing them move. Brownian particles move in the same way as what mathematicians call a random walk. In other words, the particles move a random distance in a random direction after every fixed time period. And then Einstein said, look, well, if we can record the motion of these particles, measure how far they travel on average over a set time period, we can then get a value for this diffusion coefficient. So Einstein was able to take equations from the world of things that we can't see and apply them to things that we can see. And then he was able to figure out a way to measure one of the unknown terms in that equation by observing those things that we can see. And that is the bridge between two worlds that Brownian motion creates. Three years later, Jean Perrin actually conducted that experiment and calculated Avogadro's number to be 7.15 times 10 to the 23. We now know it to be 6.02 times 10 to the 23. Hey, I mean, that's not bad, is it? There's one really interesting thing I want to say about Avogadro, but first, can we just take a minute to recognize how unbelievable Einstein was? I mean, it's obvious, I suppose, but to hammer the point home, he published three papers in one year, 1905. One on relativity, one on the photoelectric effect. He won the Nobel Prize for that one, and of course, his theory of relativity changed everything. But that third paper that he published in the same year, the one about Brownian motion helped to convince the world about atoms and molecules. And at the same time, he gave us a way to actually calculate the mass of atoms. 
It's unbelievable. That's why they call 1905 Einstein's Annus Mirabilis, which is Latin for anus mirables. I think it's like a, an exclamation. Like if you see something amazing, you go, oh wow, three papers in one year, anus mirables. Back to Avogadro though. Something surprising about gases is it doesn't matter how heavy the individual atoms or molecules of a gas are, if you have a certain volume of a gas at a specific temperature and pressure, then you will have the same number of atoms or molecules of that gas, regardless of what the gas is. So at room temperature and pressure, 22.4 litres of a gas will contain an Avogadro's number of molecules. Just playing with the numbers a bit, that means that this syringe that I've drawn 3.6 millimeters of air into, and this one that has 3.6 milliliters of carbon dioxide, and this one that has 3.6 milliliters of helium, all have 100 million trillion atoms in them, regardless of the fact that they all weigh different amounts. That's weird, isn't it? Brown, Einstein and Perrin looked at a complex and seemingly random process and were able to discern the profound truth that lay beneath. Which reminds me, I really want to tell you about Jane Street's Academy of Math and Programming that is now accepting applications for the summer 2024 program. 